speech by Mr. N. H. Knorr on the arresting title, World Conquest Soon by God's Kingdom. Mr. Knorr, who is president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, hardly requires a, an introduction to multitudes in this large audience who still vividly remember his speech to a capacity audience in this same stadium in 1953. To those who have come to hear for the first time, may we say that Mr. Knorr is a keen student of the Bible and he is well qualified to furnish us with all essential information on the subject of today's speech. Would-be world conquerors have come and gone from the world stage and left humanity in continually worsening conditions. How and when will God's kingdom succeed where all others have failed is a question of vital interest to us all and uh, we are eagerly anticipating the answer. It is therefore a great privilege to welcome all you persons of goodwill to this special session of our assembly and to call upon Mr. Knorr to speak to us on the subject World Conquest Soon by God's Kingdom. Mr. Knorr. No one likes to be conquered, for that means subjection to an enemy. But you would like to see your enemies conquered by your friends, for that means freedom and relief to you. World conquest by our enemies is a thing we dread. It seems to be the greatest evil for it appears to leave us with no hope of deliverance from any quarter. But world conquest could also be by those who love us and have our interests at heart. That would be a thing to be welcomed, for it would denote the overthrow and taking away of all of our foes. It would mean a change of world for us, for our good. Which conquest do all of us face? Which conquest is unavoidable, bound to come? Since A.D. 1914, the movement of conditions and events in the earth indicates that sooner or later some form of centralized rule of our globe will come. Yes, it has to come. Men are divided on the question of whether they want such a rule or not. Those who want such a world rule disagree as to what form it should have. There are ambitious men with certain strong persuasions who are determined to take over the rule of the earth. Other men are equally determined that a certain type of government should have no place on the earth. Because of this, fears are stirred up in the hearts of men divided fears, for the world is divided today, seemingly having but two choices to make. Those two leading choices are Western democracy and so-called godless communism. There are men who are trying to hold to a neutralism, an in-between position, but this is a very difficult and wobbly position, not free of some partiality, not free of fear. With nuclear weapons of terrifying destructive power in the hands now of both political blocks of nations, the science of war has reached a point where another world war means world suicide. People who want to live do not want that to occur. They realize that all peoples of whatever political or religious ideas must learn to get along together, to coexist, as they call it. Recently, one newspaper correspondent of the Democratic West said, 
The scientists who know most about these things say that if we don't learn how to coexist upon this earth, we shall cease to exist at all. Yet coexistence does not mean peace. It would be better to consider the present contest as competitive coexistence. Quoted from the New York Times of November the 1st. At the bottom of the present competitive coexistence lies fear. Whatever kind of coexistence there might be for a time in the future, the basis for it will be not mutual love, but mutual fear. Fear, not love of man, holds this world in its embrace. Fear has a strong hold on it and is killing it. But one visitor recently to Russia held that the Russians' fear were worse than those of the West. Quoting what he said, the Russians are more afraid of the atom bomb than are the free people of the West. He held out hope for a Pax Atomica, a peace in which atomic energy would be used for peaceful purposes, not for war machines. Though the Russians may now be in a state of fear, their leaders boast of their military strength. They claim it is superior to that of the West and that if the imperialistic West starts an atomic war with the communistic East, it would lose. The West, dominated by Christendom, does not hide its own fears. It cautions itself against losing its fears and being fooled by the communist peace offensive and dropping its guard and leaving itself open to a surprise enemy attack. The democratic nations know that the United Nations Disarmament Commission has failed in its conferences to accomplish and has accomplished nothing. They know that the leopard will not change its spots. The Ethiopian will not change his skin. And the communist bloc will not change its design, which is world domination. A world conquest, if not by trickery, infiltration and subversion, than by the appalling violence of atomic warfare. They are afraid that the present fears which may hold the communists back will one, der, one day turn to confidence, yes, overconfidence, when they have attained to atomic equality with the West. Britain's view of world matters is colored by the threat of a hydrogen war. As its former prime minister said, in such a war, England would be the communists' first bullseye. The communists, we are warned, are dedicated to our destruction, that is, the destruction of the West with its system of capitalism, free enterprise, and other freedoms. The American Secretary of State says that the United States foreign aid program must go on as the best collective defense against this unchanged design of the Soviet and Chinese communists for world domination. In an address to the Chamber of Commerce of the United States, the country's president voiced the belief that if Americans applied to the friendly independent nations the same principles in thinking, in cooperation, in respect for common and respect for common values and in trade and commerce, that we have among ourselves, we are certain of defeating communism as we are that we are all in this hall this moment. Yet, on another occasion, he said, the communist menace may face the free world for 40 years. Impatiently, the president of the American Federation of Labor charged the national government with a do-nothing policy during the country's present drift into defeatism in world affairs and that the national administration was doing nothing to expose the dangers of the policy of peaceful coexistence with communism or to halt this policy from gaining convert both in the United States and abroad. One retired American lieutenant general urged the country to break diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union and its satellites and refused to trade with these communists. 
To quote the New York Times, warning that it is very late, perhaps too late, to halt the Soviet drive toward world conquest, General Wiedemeyer said the free world must meet the challenge only if its leaders work realistically. Quoted from the New York Times of June 11, 1954. Such expressions coming from the nation that dominates the democratic powers betrays the general fear of the entire West concerning the openly expressed ultimate aims of the Russians which is not to coexist peacefully with capitalism, but to destroy capitalism and to create a communistic world directed from the Kremlin of Moscow as the seat of global government. Fear of world conquest. This is what haunts both political blocks of today's divided world. It is a fear by man of world conquest by man. Nineteen centuries ago, a prophet whose predictions have thus far proved 100% true described this present state of world tension and fear accurately when he said that after international war, there would be on the earth anguish of nations, not knowing the way out because of the roaring of the sea and its agitation while men become faint out of fear and expectation of the things coming upon the inhabited earth. For the power of the heavens will be shaken. The fear here predicted, predicted and borne out by the present world state is the fear of what man can do and is inclined to do. No, rather may be expected to do. This fear blinds the nations to what almighty God can do. It keeps even Christendom, with her hundreds of millions of copies of the Holy Bible, from seeing that what all nations certainly face is world conquest by not the West nor the East, but by heaven above, a world conquest by God's kingdom, and that very soon. At first, the announcement of this uh, future certainty may not be welcomed by many people because of their differing religions or political beliefs or racial and national likes and dislikes. The simple announcement may therefore fill them with misunderstanding and distaste. Anti-Jewish persons and, organi and organizations as well as Muslims holding to the religion of Islam, which now claims one-seventh of the world's population, may fear that the world rule of God's kingdom will mean the rise of the natural Jews, the Israelis, to the controlling position over the earth. But the Holy Scriptures written in the Hebrew tongue foretell that God's kingdom in world power will mean no such thing. Likewise, people who are not Muslims may fear that God's kingdom in control over the earth means a Muslim world. The non-Muslims know that Islam worships the one God, Allah, and that its holy book, the Quran, predicts that Islam will be the leading religion of the world. Non-Muslims do not forget that not many centuries ago, the followers of Muhammad set out to gain world control by flame and sword in harmony with the Quran. And that the prediction of the Quran that Islam is to be victorious over every other religion is still accepted. Will God's kingdom as world conqueror mean such things? The previous scriptures in the Bible, the Hebrew scriptures, which the Quran is claimed to confirm and safeguard, answer with a quietening no. A large number of religionists in the non-Catholic part of Christendom fear world conquest by the Roman Catholic hierarchy under the headship of the Pope at Vatican City. 
Non-Catholics remember that Pope Boniface VIII issued the decree which still exists in the common law. And this is what it says. We declare, say, define, pronounce it necessary to salvation for every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. End of the quotation. This papal viewpoint was upheld at St. Patrick's Cathedral Sunday, February the 16th, 1955, when a mass was offered for Christian unity of all peoples of the world under the spiritual leadership of the Pope. The priest preaching at this mass said, let us ask God to show all people that the only way to secure an abiding peace within themselves and among all nations is in union with the mother of all churches under the one head, the Holy Father, the successor of the Apostle Peter, the vicar of Christ on earth. That's quoted from the New York Times, page 20 of January the 17th, 1955. The violent effort to thrust this salvation on all mankind by forcing all to be subject to the Roman pontiff has led to cruel suffering for mankind. Non-Catholics recall how the Catholic Dr. Edmund L. Walsh of Georgetown University before a capacity audience in Memorial Continental Hall in Washington, D.C., February the 16th, 1940, outlined the Nazi war aim. He said that he had heard Adolf Hitler say that the Holy Roman Empire, which was a Germanic empire, must be reestablished. In full harmony with this, the Pope refused to excommunicate Hitler from the Roman Catholic Church, but chose to use him as the sword of the Church for re-establishing the Holy Roman Empire and extending it all over the world. Only this past May 1st, 1955, in an article entitled, What World War II Did and Didn't Settle, Published in the New York Times Magazine, the noted English historian Arnold J. Toynbee stated his belief that, quote, if there had been no World War II, Hitler would eventually have attained world domination. Not leaving out even the Soviet Union, the British Commonwealth, and the United States, and also dominion over his temporary allies, Japan and Italy. And that if Hitler had retained his wartime continental European conquest, this would have enabled him to move forward to world domination. The Roman Catholic hierarchy realized this possibility and backed up this aggressive son of the church. This 20th century world therefore came very near being conquered by a new Holy Roman Empire which its founders hoped to have last a thousand years. Hitler failed to fulfill his dream. But the aim of the hierarchy still remains the same, to conquer the world for its church by whatever agent comes to hand. Now does world conquest by God's kingdom mean that? No. Let all non-Catholics understand that. At the International Conference at Bandung, Indonesia, by 29 Asian and African nations during April of 1955, the delegates issued a communique in which they agreed, quote, in declaring that colonialism in all of its manifestations is an evil which should speedily be brought to an end, end of quote. So now let those colored races who for centuries have wreathed under the colonialism of the nations of Christendom, understand that world conquest by God's kingdom does not mean world rule by this Christendom with any manifestation of colonialism by her. Let the peoples of those colored races be glad that it means, rather, full liberation of men that live from her colonialism to the fullest extent. Yes, also freedom for all communist imperialism and colonialism. It means conquest of this earth by no opposers of mankind, of any race, color, or language, 
but conquest. By true lovers of mankind, namely by God, who gave his most beloved first gotten son for its rescue, and by this son, who gave his own human life for mankind's happy future in a new and perfect world pervaded with true brotherly love. That's the kind of a kingdom they can look forward to. There is every good reason why God himself should conquer the world and rule the earth by his kingdom. He is the creator of the earth and the rightful owner of all of it. In the beginning, the scripture tells us, God created the heavens and the earth. Those are the opening words of the Holy Bible and written under his inspiration. Compared with the vast universe, a small part of which is brought to view by our most powerful telescopes, this earth on which we live is a tiny thing. Yet this earth is big enough for us who have to live here, and for ourselves we do not want nor we, do we need anything bigger. But in the estimation of the Creator himself, this earth is a mere atom of matter. It is as nothing. Mindful of this comparison, men of this world smile in doubt at the thought that God is interested in this earth. Marvelous as it may seem, in spite of its microscopic littleness, our earth now claims the first attention of God. Why is that? Because now an issue of universal importance is under debate and called for an early settlement. That issue is, who rules the universe? Who is the sovereign of the universe? It is not the size of the earth that counts. It is the issue of universal sovereignty that is the thing, and our earth is especially tied up with this issue. For almost 6,000 years now, the chief adversary of God has been the invisible ruler of this earth. He is Satan, the devil. His rule has been only by the permission of the Almighty not to go on forever, but for the purpose of putting the issue to a thorough test. So the point to be settled is, May God's chief adversary lay claim to even such an atom of matter as our earth and rule it indefinitely in defiance of God? Or is God the sovereign of even the smallest part of his universe? You are interested in the final settlement of this issue because you live here. God is interested in you because he put you here, creating your first father, in his own image and in his own likeness. What you think of this God, your creator, is of importance to him. He will either kill you for it or keep you alive for it. It is necessary to your living forever that you recognize him as the universal sovereign. In proof of that, the inspired psalmist Asaph long ago prayed according to the, oppo uh, the opposers of God's universal uh, sovereignty. And this is what he said in his prayer at Psalm 83, 16 to 18. Fill, <clears throat> Fill their faces with confusion, that they may seek thy name, O Jehovah. Let them be put to shame and dismayed forever. Yea, let them be confounded and perish that they may know that thou alone, whose name is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. The creator, whose name is Jehovah. <laughs> the creator, whose name is Jehovah, has a right to assert his sovereignty over this earth at any time he chooses to do so. By what means has he chosen to do so? It is by means of his kingdom. More than 19 centuries ago, his most beloved firstborn son was down here on earth 
as the man Jesus Christ. God, his heavenly Father, anointed him with Holy Spirit. He anointed him to be the king of that coming kingdom. Accordingly, the Son of God preached, The kingdom of the heavens has drawn near, he told his listeners. I must declare the good news of the kingdom of God, because for this I was sent forth. He told his disciples to seek that kingdom first. He taught them this prayer, and they prayed it to God. Our Father in the heavens, let your name be sanctified. Let your kingdom come. Let your will come to pass as in heaven, also upon the earth. Ever since then, his true followers have offered that prayer and in faith have looked for the coming of the kingdom of their heavenly Father. God promised to answer prayers in harmony with his will. God's kingdom is therefore under obligation to come. For God's Son taught his disciples to pray for the kingdom. His disciples have prayed these 19 centuries for its coming. And God is bound to answer that prayer and to bring his kingdom. <laughs> God is bound to bring the kingdom also in fulfillment of his inspired prophecies pronounced in his own name, Jehovah. In Psalm 22, many verses of which were fulfilled by his son Jesus Christ, it is prophesied. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn unto Jehovah, and all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is Jehovah's, and he is the ruler over the nations. Jehovah promised to have the kingdom rest upon the shoulders of his son Jesus Christ. Born at Bethlehem, Judah, in Palestine over 19 centuries ago, and he said this in his prophecy. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from henceforth even forever. The zeal of Jehovah of hosts will perform this. That was quoted from Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. We have already had the birth of the promised child, this Son of God. Just as surely there must come the birth of the government that rests upon his shoulder. The heated zeal of Jehovah brings that kingdom to birth. His prophecy through Isaiah said that the governments of the, the government of the Son of God the Prince of Peace, shall be upon the throne of David. King David of ancient time was a forefather, a royal ancestor of Jesus Christ, and reigned upon Mount Zion at Jerusalem. This does not mean, however, that Jesus Christ himself must reign on earth at Jerusalem, and that he must be the king of the Jews, the Israelis of today in Palestine. Jesus Christ of the conquering kingdom of God is not the king of the, Jew, of the Jews. He is the king of the new world. When Governor Pontius Pilate was examining Jesus, he said to him, or rather asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, My kingdom is no part of this world. If my kingdom were a part of this world, my attendants would have thought that I should not be delivered up to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from this source. Jesus will be king of all the people of the new world because he laid down his perfect human life as an atoning sacrifice for all men who gained the new world. These inhabitants of the coming new world were long ago foreshadowed or typified by the twelve tribes of Israel on their yearly day of atonement when sacrifices were offered by the high priest for the sins of the entire nation. For 40 years, King David ruled over those tribes of Israel or Jacob. It was only because all mankind were typified by these 12 tribes of Israel or Jacob 
that God's angel Gabriel announced the coming birth of Jesus to his prospective mother, the virgin Jewish Mary, and then said, This one will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and Jehovah God will give him the throne of David his father, and he will be king over the house of Jacob forever, and there will be no end of his kingdom. The ancient typical David did reign only over the house of Israel or Jacob, and over all the subjected people in the promised land. But the prophecies show it is not to be so with the King, Jesus Christ. Mark this fact. Jesus Christ is not only David's son, but also his Lord. For in uttering Psalm 110 under divine inspiration, King David himself called him my Lord, saying, Jehovah saith unto my Lord, when Jesus asked the Jewish Pharisees, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said, David. He then asked them, How then is it that David by inspiration called him Lord, saying, Jehovah said to my Lord, in being not only King David's son, but also his Lord, Jesus Christ is a higher king, and his kingdom is therefore a greater kingdom. It is to be not just over faithful Christianized Jews, but also over all families and nationalities of mankind who likewise accept this son of David as king and as the seed of Abraham by whom they can procure the blessings that Jehovah mentioned in his promise to his friend Abraham, the forefather of both King David and of Jesus Christ. Psalm 110, in which King David addressed his descendants, Jesus Christ as my Lord, shows that uh, he was to be higher than King David. Yes, as high as one could get above King David. The psalm shows him seated not on David's material throne in Mount Zion in Jerusalem, but at the right hand of the Most High God. Psalm 110 opens with the words, Jehovah said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Jehovah will send forth the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Jesus Christ could not be seated at God's right hand and at the same time be seated on the literal Mount Zion on the earth for the earth is God's footstool. It is therefore on the spiritual Mount Zion the heavenly seat of government where he sits to rule at God's command. How did Jesus Christ get there? How could he possibly get there since he died a martyr's death more than 19 centuries ago. It was by resurrecting him from the dead, not to be a human king on earth, but to be a spiritual king at God's right hand in the highest heavens. On the day of Pentecost, 50 days from Jesus' resurrection, the apostle Peter explained it all, saying under the power of God's Holy Spirit, quote, This Jesus God resurrected, of which fact we are all witnesses. Therefore, because he was exalted to the right hand of God and received the promised Holy Spirit from the Father, he has poured out this which we see and hear. Actually, David did not ascend to the heavens, but he himself said, Jehovah said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies the stool for your feet. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for a certainty that God made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you impaled. Acts, the second chapter, verses 32 to 36. So it is from heaven that Jehovah God at the due time sends out the scepter of Christ's strength to rule amidst his enemies. These enemies include all nations, including Christendom, which takes the name of Christ, yes. All these must be brought low, like a throne stool on which to put his feet. How? 
without our at once stating how Bible prophecies say it will be done. Let us see how the world conditions and the lineup of the nation show that it has to be done. First of all, after the Roman Catholic Empire was set up in 800 AD with Emperor Charlemagne as the sword of the church, the Roman Catholic hierarchy tried to carry out its ideas of God's kingdom to spread and maintain the religious empire by means of wars with carnal weapons, crusades, and torture chamber inquisitions. Napoleon Bonaparte brought about the collapse of the Holy Roman Empire and put a stop to the hierarchy's violent efforts to conquer the world by the kingdom of the Papal Caesars. Later in World War I, the hierarchy tried to use Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany as the sword of the church, but with failure. Then the Nazi leader, a son of the church, came to power, and again the hierarchy tried to use the sword of the state, then in Hitler's hand. But again the hierarchy's hopes were blasted, proving once more that God's purpose to establish his kingdom under Christ will not be by means of the hierarchy. The Apostle Paul wrote that the weapons of Christian warfare are not carnal, and that the true Christian should take in his hand the sword of the Spirit, that is the word of God. But the hierarchy has chosen to take the sword of the state, the sword of the Caesars of her religious empire. Christ told Caesar's representatives, Pontius Pilate, that his kingdom was not of this world, but the hierarchy have made themselves a part of this world by trying to have on earth a religio-political kingdom. The hierarchy claims to be the bride of Christ, but she has wedded herself to the political rulers of this world in a marriage of church and state. Thus she has violated her claimed engagement to Christ and not waited for him to come. The kingdom of God has never come by her, and it never will. The Protestant wing of Christendom has claimed that God's kingdom will come by the peaceable conversion of this world. Even the rulers of this world to be converted and become Christians and lead their subjects into Christianity. In all unchristian governments, that which is opposed to God's glory would thus be destroyed and the governments would as it were received uh, a Christian baptism, and then all these governments would become Christian. Yet, all such governments staying unchanged in their political pattern, whether democracies, autocracies, kingdoms, duchies, or dictatorships. The worldly governments would become Christian, and yet preserve their characteristic form of worldly rule. Christianity would pervade every political government and be the basis of every code of law and be professed by every people supporting such governments. Under this idea, the Protestant churches, which also claim to be engaged to Christ, the bridegroom, have made marriage unions with political rulers of this world. But has this Protestant idea of how God's kingdom comes and conquers worked out? During the 16th centuries, since the Roman Emperor Constantine became a Roman Catholic, has this worked out? Or since the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, the answer is no. For three-fourths of the world's population does not yet profess Christianity. And as far as one-fourth that does confess to be Christian, shall we say, that God's kingdom has come in its case? Let God's word, the Bible, now do the answering. At Romans the 14th chapter in the 17th verse, and I read from a Catholic Bible, and this is what it says. The kingdom of God does not consist in food and drink, but in justice and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If the present Christendom 
is that much of God's kingdom come to this earth, in what way is she an example of justice to the non-Christian people? How is she the refuge of peace? When two world wars were started in Christendom, and now she is the inventress of the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb for a third world war, with only an Adams for Peace plan as a salve for the conscience and for good business reasons. Is Christendom joyful over her condition, filled with the joy of the Spirit? Can we find that out by... Uh, Looking to God's word, yes. We certainly can find that out by looking to see whether she has the fruitage of the Holy Spirit. For, said Jesus, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Matthew 7, 19. Does Christendom have the fruit of the Holy Spirit? In either her Catholic or her Protestant part. What does the Bible say that fruit is? Listen. The fruit of the Spirit is charity, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, modesty, contingency. Against such things there is no law. And they who being belong to Christ have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. Is Christendom producing a crop of this good fruit, that she may not, like a bad tree, be cut down and thrown into the fire? Christendom's newspapers, her magazines, her radio, television, court records, police station records, and other reflectors of the life of Christendom and her mora uh, morality, of the people of Christendom will give all of you the answer. We do not have to give you the answer to that question. Her record, especially since A.D. 1914, the year of World War I, answers, it is an open book which Christendom cannot keep the critical eyes of the non-Christian people from reading. Let the honest, unprejudiced people outside Christendom express their judgment. The so-called heathen know whether Christendom is full of the fruit of God's Spirit or full of the works of the flesh. For the teeming billions of heathen have suffered shamefully because of the works of the flesh with which Christendom overflows. Carrying on such works of the flesh and increasing them since A.D. 1914, Christendom will not attain the kingdom of God nor possess the kingdom of God. She is no part of God's kingdom come. She is against the kingdom of God. Like a bad tree, she has produced bad fruit. And by Jesus' own words, she must be cut down and thrown into the fire. Especially this because she has pretended to be a good tree of God's kingdom from which the fruit of the Spirit was to be expected. But she has done an injustice to God's kingdom by putting it in a disgraceful light in the eyes of all heathendom. <laughs> At the same time that Christendom religiously stockpiles nuclear bombs for hot war against atheistic communism, she tries to appear producing the peace fruitage of the spirit by making agreements to keep this world at peace. But in this, her hypocrisy is apparent to God, for she tries to keep the peace by the strength of carnal weapons of this world. Instead of letting God fight the battle his way, she would fight the battle for her life by this world's way. It was Christendom herself that set up the League of Nations after World War I and called it the political expression of the kingdom of God on earth. This led to the impression that Hitler knocked out the League, when Hitler knocked out the League of Nations in 1939, that God's kingdom in its visible political expression had lost, not conquered. Since World War II, she, yes, Christendom, has put forward the lead successor, the United Nations, as the world's best hope for peace. Which leads us to ask, peace 
through which nation? The nations only of Christendom, or so-called Christian nations, united with non-Christian heathen nations, or also with communist nations? Is God's kingdom to be linked with pagan heathen nations, with atheistic communistic nations? Ask yourself whether the national makeup of the United Nations sponsored by Christendom shows obedience by Christendom to the Bible command. And this is what the Bible says. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. The United Nations cannot pass for the political expression of God's kingdom on earth. It is against the real kingdom of God and Christendom by sponsoring, promoting, recommending, and maintaining this alliance of the worldly nations, also with all the other political alliances within its framework betrays herself as a worldly conspirator against God's kingdom under Christ. She is the enemy of God, the chief opposer of God's kingdom. She is against having the nations of this world hand over their sovereignty to God, that he might be recognized as the universal sovereign, the most high, even over our pinpoint of an earth. She does not even hand over her own sovereignty, but prefers democracy to theocracy. She stands condemned of opposition to God's universal sovereignty by her own mouth. By the August 1954 report of the Protestant World Council of Churches from Evanston, Illinois, that declared that, quote, democratic humanism had evolved into a disregard or denial of God's sovereignty over the world. Christendom, as an enemy, must also be put under the feet of Christ. She also must be conquered with the rest of the enemy world. How then? <laughs> How then must the world conquest by God's kingdom be? Bible prophecy answers, not by peaceful means, but by violent war, the battle of Armageddon, the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Psalm 110, already quoted from, prophesied that Jehovah God would send out the scepter of Christ's strength with the command, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. His ruling amidst them will culminate in the battle of Armageddon and the destruction of all enemies, including traitorous Christendom. For Psalm 110, 5 and 6 goes on to show Christ in battle action, saying to him, The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wild earth. All the world and its friends must be conquered, for all the world is the enemy, which is why James 4.4 4 asks, Do you not know that the friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world is constituting himself an enemy of God. That it will be world conquest and that all nations would rage about it. From 1914 onward, the prophecy concerning the end of this world states in these words, There were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. We give thanks to thee, Lord God Almighty, who art and who wast, that thou hast taken thy great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but thy wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. This kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ 
is the new world kingdom. There can be no peaceful coexistence between God's kingdom and this ferocious, beastly system of things that exists upon this earth. It has been destroying or bringing ruin to this earth, and it itself must be brought to ruin. That will be soon, just as soon as the Battle of Armageddon is fought. The revelation pulls back the curtain that hides the invisible and lets it see that demons are leading all the kings of the entire inhabited earth to that field of battle. It is a world conflict that is shaping up. Read the description of that at Revelation, the 16th chapter, verses 14 to 16. And then read the advanced description of the battle itself at Revelation, the 19th chapter, verses 11 to 21, and see the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war. Not against world communism, no, but against Jehovah's Christ. See them also defeated, all of them, in the greatest war ever in God's universe. The world conquest, however, is not ended at the destruction of Christendom and its international alliance and all the rest of the symbolic beast or visible system of things. To be a world conquest, the invisible part of this world, its wicked spiritual heavens, must also go, and go they will. Immediately following the vision of the battle with the visible beastly system of things on earth, Revelation, the 20th chapter, verses 1 to 3, unveils before us the invisible part of the conquest. The seizing and binding of the superhuman ruler of this world, Satan the devil, together with all of his hordes, the demons. They will be cast into a prison abyss, not with freedom of movement there, but bound as with a great chain, with a sealed cover over the abyss to keep the most powerful part of this old world out of contact with the new earth of the new world. Their abyssing will be the crowning triumph of God's kingdom at the Battle of Armageddon. For the thousand years of Christ's reign in heaven with his true bride of his saintly followers, Satan and his demons will be as dead to the universe. At the end of Christ's thousand year reign, they will be let out of the abyss, but only for a short while, for a final test of the subjects of God's kingdom. The test being over, they will then be wiped out with no trace left, as if they had never been. Therefore, let all nations know that not world conquest by atheism, communism, but world conquest by God's kingdom is what they have to face. If before Armageddon ended the earth were conquered by communism or by any other radical or aggressive group, this in turn would finally be conquered by God's kingdom. Nations in and outside of Christendom err in leaving this ultimate, inevitable world conquest out of their deliber deliberations. Nations outside of the Iron Curtain are anxious to hear news from behind the Iron Curtain concerning the atomic arms build-up of the communists. But they show no concern about God's arsenal of destructive forces for Armageddon, far worse than any international atomic world war. So, at Armageddon they will be made to know the war potential of God. But why do we say world conquest by God's kingdom soon? We say soon because the Bible says that the faithful students of God's word and observers of the fulfillment of its prophecy would be kept informed on God's times and seasons. It says, quote, Whenever it is that people are saying, Peace and security, then sudden destruction is to be instantly upon them, just as the pang of distress upon a pregnant woman. And they will have no means of escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that that day should overtake you as it would thieves, for you are all sons of light and of the day, for Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Jehovah God is the greatest timekeeper, and his time schedule in the Bible marks the year 1914 
as the year for the bringing forth of his kingdom under Christ, as the time for God to send the scepter of his enthroned son out of the heavenly Zion with the order, rule in the midst of your enemies. At Revelation, the 12th chapter, verses 5 and 10, the description of the birth of the kingdom shows that he must rule them with an iron rod to dash all the nations to pieces as though they were potter's vessels. The fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy on the evidences provided us to be in this world's time of the end makes certain the date of 1914. From that year on, we have had, as he foretold, world war with other terrible afflictions, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, persecution of the true Christians, the abounding of iniquity or increasing of lawlessness, the love of the greater number cooling off, hate running riot, the League of Nations, its successor, the United Nations, unrelievable anguish of nations not knowing the way out, Christ judging the true Christians and the separating of the people of all the nations over the issue of God's kingdom by Christ. In less than 50 years since 1914, we have had all these things except now Armageddon itself. And Jesus said, to the generation that experiences all these things as we ourselves have. And now I quote from Matthew 24. Likewise also you, when you see all these things, know that he is near at the door. Truly I say to you that this generation will by no means pass away until all these things occur. To show that we should rejoice rather than give way to anguish and fear with the world, Jesus said this at Luke 21. As these things start to occur, raise yourselves erect and lift up your heads because your deliverance is getting near. When you see these things occurring, know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things occur. We have every reason, therefore, to say without hesitation, world conquest by God's kingdom soon. What then will world conquest by God's kingdom soon mean to you? Your sudden destruction? It will, if at Armageddon you are not found on the side now being warned of coming destruction this world, including Christendom? Or will it mean to you your deliverance? It will. If you are then found on the side of the world conquerors, Jehovah God and his reigning King Jesus Christ, this is where the New World Society of Jehovah's Witnesses have taken their stand, determined to stay there faithfully till Armageddon, and not only till, but also right through the Battle of Armageddon. Through Armageddon, you say, yes. For the deliverance that we see getting near for us means being eyewitnesses of the end of Armageddon with world conquest by God's triumphant kingdom and thus surviving Armageddon into God's new world. By taking your stand with this new world society now, you too may survive Armageddon into God's new world. But there is more to it than that. God's kingdom will not halt its conquest by merely the destruction of the devil's old world. It will go on to further conquest by undoing all the evil effects of Satan, the devil's wickedness practiced upon the human race. It will conquer the bad conditions of the earth upon which Armageddon survivors must live one-third of which earth lies desert today, with further ruin being caused by the world's ruinous policies toward this earth. It will transform this entire earth into a perfect paradise 
for mankind's eternal home and nourishment. It will wipe out from their minds, features, and bodies of the obedient Armageddon survivors all the traces of the sin and its degradation that Satan introduced among us by our first parents, Adam and Eve. The kingdom will stop at nothing. No, not at death itself. Death and the greedy grave must yield to the triumphant kingdom. God's word guarantees it with this prophecy concerning the King Jesus Christ. I quote from 1 Corinthians 15. He must rule as king until God has put all enemies under his feet. As the last enemy, death is to be destroyed. For God subjected all things under his feet. That means the resurrection of the dead. That means the wiping out of graveyards by the returning to life of those whose names appear on the gravestones. It means the offering to those 